the only way I know how to describe it now is, is that there was all this, these thoughts just churning in my head. And there was so much going on inside my head is that's kind of like my eyeballs were turned backwards and the whole world was inside my head because of all this anguish. And so I wasn't seeing where I was going and I wasn't, I, it was like I was just inward and there was all this anguish. Okay. When you got to the house, went in the back door, do you remember where you went? I got upstairs, I know that, but I don't know which route I took. Okay. And when you went upstairs, um, do you remember where, it, where you went when you got to the top of the stairs? The door to the bedroom was closed, but the next door was open, so I went in that door. Okay, and where does that door lead to? To a, what they call a TV room, but it's part of the bedroom suite on that side of the house. Okay. And was anybody up at that time that you saw? No. Okay. Do you remember, were you holding the gun at that time? I don't remember. I guess so. Okay. What did, uh, when you went into the TV room, what did, you, what was the next thing that you did? The TV room door was wide open, and then the door to their bedroom was part open. It wasn't closed. It was like a jar. Okay. And did you go into that? Did you then go into their bedroom? Yes. Okay. And what did you do when you went into their bedroom? Well, the motion that I made, although I don't think it was a big motion, the movement that I made into their bedroom woke them up, and they moved, and somebody screamed, call the police, and I said, no, and I just fired the gun, and this big noise went off, and, and then I grabbed the phone and got the hell out of there, but I wasn't even in that room. I mean, it just was an explosion. It just, I moved, they moved, the gun went off, and it was like, ah, and it was that fast. I, I want to go through this. Um, I want to go at least as much as we can step by step. Um, how would you describe your memory of that event? Do you have a clear memory of everything that happened? What I, what I can tell you in words now is it seems like a slideshow where slides are missing. You know, I remember driving up to the front of the house. I remember the front of the house, but I don't remember if I went to the front door and I don't remember going around. And then I know I was upstairs, and I remember opening the door to the bedroom. So I see myself doing that, but then I don't see anything else. And then I, I know I grabbed the phone, but I don't remember leaving the house or running down the stairs or anything. So it's like there's these spots missing. It's like a flash of this, and then she's over there, and there's a flash of that, and a flash of this. And that's what I told people later is, you know, I just, I didn't see anything in that room. Now, when you first went into the door, do you remember how, what did you, do you remember what happened when you first went into the door of the bedroom? Well, I hardly even got in. I opened the door and I step, stepped into the bedroom, like one step. Did you, what did you do at that point? Well, I was gonna say, you know, Dan, wake up, I have to talk to you. Do you, did you say something? I don't know. What happened at that point? I walked in and they moved, and they moved away from me toward the other place, and I heard Linda say, call the police. Now, had, do you remember them talking to you at all, saying something to you other than the... No, nobody said anything to me, I don't think. Okay. And what happened when they went towards, what's the next thing you remember after they went towards the phone and, and said, call the police? I kind of like screamed, like this huge scream, like, no, and the gun went off, and I just remember one time and one noise, but I know that I must have done that because you have to do that on the gun, but it was so fast. I just went, ah! Now, did you scream out loud? I felt like I made a huge scream, but I don't know if I made any noise. It was just, it was just all sensation. The sense, you know, I just, you move in, and, and then they moved, and then it was this huge explosion and scream and every, all at once. Do you remember pu actually pulling the trigger? No. Is that a gun where you have to pull the trigger? Yes, I, 
I asked people that day, do you have to pull the trigger? And they told me that you had to, but I don't remember pulling it even the first time. But you remember a large bang? Yes. Okay. What's the next thing you remember after that? Just grabbing the phone so that he couldn't get on it because Dan was trying to get on the phone and grabbed the phone and I tried to get out of the room and it kind of jerked and I jerked it back and pulled it out of the wall and I think I threw it on the top of the stairs. I don't know. I may have just put it there. Now after you heard the boom, um, were you out of bullets? I assume so, yes. And how did you know that? Because there was no more noise and the, the gun was clicking. Okay. Did you hear the gun click? I don't remember the gun clicking, no. Okay. I just know that there was this huge noise and then there was no more noise. And then after the noise, when you said the, the gun was clicking, was that after the noise? The clicking sound of the gun? I guess. Okay. Was there any reason that you uh, were scared that Dan was going to grab the phone? Yes, because every time I went to talk to him, he'd, say, he'd call the police and have me arrested on the restraining order for trying to talk to him for being within 100 yards of his house. And now at that point in time when you left, do you know whether anyone was hit? No, I thought Dan was after me. Okay. Had, did, now, did Dan say, um, did, do you remember Dan sitting up in bed and saying, okay, you shot me, I'm dead? No. Do you, have you ever said that? To, have you ever repeated that to anybody? I know Lily says I said that. So, so I must have said that, but I heard Lily say I said that. I don't remember that. Okay, and have you repeated it since then to people? Yes. And why was that? Because Lily said I said it and it must have happened. Or I must have said it. Eventually turn yourself in that day. Yes. And were you taken to jail after you were arrested? Were you taken yes. after you were, yes. after you turned yourself in, were you eventually taken to Las Colinas? Yes. Okay. And have you had conversations with a number of people since you've been in jail? Yes. How were you feeling emotionally or mentally? Um, it was, it's hard to decide. I was very confused, but I was, I was, safe in jail you know they locked the rest of the world out when they locked me in this little corner cell and that was good for me because then they Dan couldn't get me and um, I could just be safe in there and I really liked that that nobody could get me the um, the first uh, two or three months that you were in jail were you able to come to grips with what had happened no I wanted to, um, I wasn't able to deal with it. I wasn't able to hug my children or talk to my children. Um, I wasn't able to go to Dan's funeral. I wasn't able to tell anybody how sorry I was that all this had happened, anybody was affected by it. I haven't been able to get in touch with any of the people who matter in this case. Were you able to, um, were you able to talk to the? Uh, were you able to talk to the boys uh, about what was going on? No, Dan's brother took them out of town right away, and I was I was kept from them for almost two years, and I wasn't allowed to send birthday cards or Christmas cards. I haven't had a phone conversation, but this summer in August I was able to see them for an hour or two, but I wasn't allowed to mention anything. I had to act like that nothing had happened. So I really want to talk to my kids about this and to a lot of other people, but they listen to all my phone conversations and they copy every letter that goes in and out. And it's that, you know, everyone's afraid everything will get twisted around and used against them. And so we haven't been able, none of us have been able to deal honestly with a lot of the things that need to be dealt with. I have no further questions, John. You, while we're on the subject, we'll come back, but when you say that you were correcting things that had been written, in fact, you made a specific correction with Amy Wallace about what Dan Broderick had said after you shot him. 
you indicated that Lee, who had testified that he said, okay, okay, you shot me, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. You called up Amy Wallace and you told her, no, that's not right. That's not what he said. He said, okay, you got me, I'm dead. Right. Correct? Right. Didn't you just testify before lunch that you didn't remember him saying anything to that effect? I didn't remember him sitting up in bed and saying anything like that, no. You don't remember testifying I, last time? But I remember... Excuse me. Do you remember testifying the last time you testified that he put his hands up and he said, okay, you got me? Yes. Didn't you just testify earlier today that you didn't remember him saying anything like that? Well, I don't know. What I really testified to is I don't really know what happened in that room. It was all these flashes of things. I Excuse me, you, you answer the question. Let me just ask you this. If you don't really know what <sighs> happened in that room, how was it you could write or call Amy Wallace and correct her about what had been said about what happened in that room? Because at that time, way back then, I thought Dan said that. Okay, so way back then when you talked to Amy Wallace back in March of 1990, you had a clear recollection then of what had occurred in that room. Is that what you're saying? No, no. In March, no. When Lee said that in the very beginning, in November, that I said that, we discussed it. I said, I, I couldn't have said that because she said I didn't know if I shot anybody, so he couldn't have said that. Did you not call up Amy Wallace and tell her, correct her? He didn't say you shot me, correcting one of her daughters. He said, okay, you got me. Your Honor, that's been okay. answered. Sustained. Okay. When you talked to the uh, author from People Magazine, which was just last month, isn't it true that you indicated absolutely no remorse, that Linda knowingly dated a married man, that you felt equally unconcerned about the death of your ex-husband? I wasn't the one who had the affair. I won't accept the blame for what happened. Didn't you say that? I don't remember specifically saying that. If he says I said it, I said it. Well, would you like me to show it to you to see if it refreshes your recollection? No, I'm sure. If it's written there, it says it. just one interview with Amy Wallace. You had numerous interviews with her, correct? Before she wrote a, a large article about you? So in the very beginning, so I would have talked to her. I don't remember how many times she might have come there. Or I mostly talked to her on the phone, I think. Is it correct when she describes that over the next six months you called and wrote often, always eager to talk? <coughs> sure, I don't know. I'm just asking you if that's a correct indication of how many times you talked Six to months from when it happened to when she wrote the article. Yes? Probably, yes. And she too indicated in her article that described you as being intelligent, angry, and without remorse. Were those her words? Yes. Well, if that's what she thought, that's what she thought. Well, are you indicating that you indicated something different to her, that you expressed remorse She to didn't her? give me an intelligence test. She didn't know if I had any remorse. Those are her words. She didn't know if I was any of those things. Well, she described that when she talked to you the very first meeting, that you insisted that all your actions were justified. You said, quote, he went off with the bimbo at 40 driving a red Corvette. Haven't we heard this before? Did you say that to Amy Wallace? I did say that. You also told Amy Wallace that you were upset that people were mourning Dan and Linda, didn't you? I was upset at the way that the funeral was handled, yes. You said, it always makes me mad when people call them the victims. You're tired of hearing people mourn Dan and Linda. Did you say that? I thought the way the, the funeral was handled was wrong. And it wasn't that you were upset that you couldn't go to the funeral. What you were upset about and that you expressed to several people was that Dan had gotten full rights in the Catholic Church and you didn't think that was appropriate because he was divorced. No, I was very upset I, I didn't go to the funeral. I would have handled the funeral extremely differently, however. I mean, but did you tell Deputy Woods, for example, similar to what you said to Maria Peralta, that Linda was quote, a fucking bitch. 
She was living in my house, driving my car, sleeping in my bed. Your Honor, I'll object. It assumes facts, not evidence. Sustained. I'm asking her if she said that. Your Honor, it assumes facts, not evidence that those of our Maria Peralta's words. No, I'm, excuse me, I'm talking about a statement you made to Deputy Woods. Re rephrase it. Did you make a statement to Deputy Woods that Linda is a fucking bitch, she was living in my bed, driving my car, sleeping in my bed? No, because those are not true, and I didn't make them to Maria Peralta, and I didn't make them to Deputy Wood. Right. And you have, for example, told people, like Mr. Hargraves, who was representing you, that your marriage to Dan was the most ideal marriage of, ever, of any couple. You were very happy with, happy with Dan. Did you make that statement to Mr. Hargraves? At times, uh, yes. Yes, I believe that. And you told Dr. Goldsband that we had a wonderful marriage. Is that it? I thought so. I thought we did. You told Dr. Robinson we had an ideal marriage until Linda came along? Yes, probably. I, I, Dr. Robinson, I don't even remember meeting him, though. Okay. Did you tell Dr. DeFrancesca that you were always happy and that you had a happy marriage until Linda came along? Right. I, I would have said that, probably. Well, when was it? I'm, I'm a little confused. When was it that you started describing your marriage as being rotten from the beginning? When, exactly at the time you're on. When we separated, I then withdrew my consent for Dan Broderick being in control of everything. Until that point, I totally consented in our marriage to the way, to our agreement that he was in charge of everything. And when he walked... Excuse me, wait a minute. Maybe, perhaps you misunderstood my question. When you talked to Dr. Goldsband, for example, that was in 1990. That was after you killed Dan and Linda Broderick. And when he asked you to describe the marriage, you described it as a wonderful marriage, right? I thought it was. It was a very unequally structured marriage, but I went along with it, and I was happy when it was like that. Well, how, how is it that you, at other times, described to other people that the marriage was a disaster from day one? Dan was a control freak, and he, he had control in this marriage. As long as I didn't fight it, it was okay with me. Okay, but if we're talking about after separation, let's say you've, you've already separated. You already know now what you think about the marriage. When you talk to Dr. Goldspan, when you talk to Mr. Hargraves during the divorce, when you talk to Dr. DeFrancesca, uh, when you talk to Dr. Robinson, you describe your marriage as being a wonderful, ideal marriage. As long as it worked, it was. As long as I went along with this ridiculous plan that I was in, it worked. It, it wasn't you, you fair. You didn't and qualify it, that at all when you talked to these people. You said it was a wonderful, ideal marriage until Linda came along. Yeah, yeah. So your anger at Dan Broderick after the separation is what made you change your feelings about whether or not you'd had a good marriage before the separation, correct? Right. It is true that you had discussed divorce on many occasions with Dan Broderick during the course of your marriage. I don't know. No, we didn't discuss divorce. You threatened was, divorce on many occasions. The same way I, I've been said to have threatened to kill him, yes. Well, you didn't just threaten to kill him. You did kill him. Well, and we did get a divorce. Yes. And you threatened divorce even in the first year of your marriage, didn't you? And probably to kill him in the first year of my marriage, too. Yes. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Elizabeth Ann Broderick, guilty of the crime of murder. Elizabeth Broderick sat calmly with the hint of a smile on her face as the clerk announced the verdict of guilty of murder. But there were several anxious moments before they said it was murder in the second degree. And fifth degree thereof as murder in the second degree. Victim Daniel Broderick. There was no mistaking the smile as she heard it was second degree murder in the deaths of both Dan and Linda Broderick. I allowed the voices in my head to completely take over. I heard all the past voices of your, you know, all the bad things from my parents and my kids and Dan and everybody else, and I'm this horrible, awful, worthless failure of a human being. And then I allowed the stress of, of losing my house and going to jail and not having a home to put the kids, because if he throws me in jail again, I lose my house. Uh, Ms. And I was just afraid of... Mrs. Broderick, stop right there a minute, okay? You're worried about your husband putting you in jail again, yet you consciously 
take the gun that you purchased in March, you go to the house, which you got a key to get in, okay? You'd sound like you knocked on the door and rang the doorbell here, okay? And said, hello, hey, can we chat? You didn't do that. You went in the back door. You knew the house well. You went to the bedroom. It's 5.30 in the morning, and you killed two people. I went to Dan's house to ask him to just give me the kids and leave me the hell alone. This is too many years of this ongoing stuff. I never got to ask him or say anything. Linda came at me, and the gun went off over and across the bed, and the physical evidence proves that. And I didn't think of anything. I was was just startled. I was just startled. It wasn't... I don't even remember pulling the trigger even once. I was just startled. Miss Broderick, you went to that home with a gun. You went to that home with a loaded gun. You went to that home uninvited at 5.30 in the morning when most people are in bed asleep. Okay? So you can see where the commissioner, can you understand where she's coming from? She lunged at you. Excuse me, you weren't even supposed to be there. You're in there with a gun. So there was some intent to go there to do something more than just chit-chat. I was not, obviously, not thinking straight or thinking clearly at all, and I thought if I had the gun, I could make them listen to me. You, you told me earlier you don't even remember pulling the phone from the wall. I don't remember pulling the phone, but Dan spoke to me. Dan spoke to me without any pain or any flinching or anything. Dan said, okay, okay, you got me, like that. And I had no bullets left or anything. I just ran out of the room. But I, that's why I didn't know he was hit or anything was wrong with him. And I thought he was chasing me. And I was running away from Dan. He spoke to me absolutely clearly with no pain I had no idea he was hit. I thought he was chasing me. He spoke to me clearly, plainly. I have great remorse and feel terrible for all the needless, senseless pain and suffering I've caused so many. I took the lives of two wonderful people who were loved by many. For that, I will be forever sorry. That was never my intention. If staying in prison longer would change something or bring them back, I would do that. But that would accomplish nothing. I can never undo or repair the damage I have done in the past. My only hope is to go forward in peace and love and try to heal this family. My name is Dan Broderick, B-R-O-D-E-R-I-C-K. I'm the son of the victims of the victims and, and Betty. It saddens me to say this. But I don't think my mother is a stable and healthy person. I don't, think, I don't think she has been for decades. I don't think she's remorseful and insightful to what she's done. She has never expressed wanting forgiveness from us, nor giving forgiveness to my dad and Linda. She has never apologized until today for what she's done, and has never acknowledged the pain and suffering for her actions. <clears throat> In the 20 years since the incident, she hasn't done much that I'm aware of, for redemption or correcting her wrongs. My name is Kim Piggins, P-I-G-G-I-N-S, and I'm the oldest child of Dan and Betty Broderick. I was 19 years old when my dad and Linda died. My youngest sibling was a mere 10. It was at that moment that the four of us became orphans. Not only did my mother's actions take our father from us, but it took her away from us as well. I just always hoped that one day she would come around and realize what she had done. Yet, she still not once, until today, has taken responsibility for her actions or expressed any remorse for the damage she's caused. She has continuously maintained that she was the victim in all this and had no choice but to act as she did. She defends her behavior to this day and makes justifications that are irrational and without factual basis. The truth of the matter is that my parents had a horrible divorce and they treated each other very poorly. But that often happens at the dissolution of a marriage. Nothing that transpired between them was grounds for murder or, frankly, any of the violent actions that my mother took towards my dad and Linda in the years prior to their deaths. I am the daughter of Dan and Betty Broderick. I have come here today in support of my mother's release. I am not trying to deny the heartbreaking loss my family has suffered through my mother's crimes. I love my father, and I want to honor his memory. My life has been very difficult trying to get by with this tragedy. (laughs) and the lack of my parents. My mother has been a good prisoner for the last 20 years, as all of her prison records will show. She has expressed remorse, and I feel that she should have a chance to live her older years outside of the prison walls. I'm Rhett Broderick. 
um, son of, do I have to spell it? B-R-O-D-E-R-I-C-K, um, the son of um, Dan and Betty Broderick. Um, I, too, support my mother's release. Um, I have spent two-thirds of my life without my parents. Um, I was very young when my mom was a broken woman. She was consumed by anger and grief, and she was so depressed and just not the woman that she is today. Um, I, there's, there's no... Um, I'm very confident that my mom would succeed outside of prison. I, I think that the uh, psychological evaluation um, is accurate. I do not think she's a risk to society. I think she'd be a very contributing member of society, and I think that um, the longer she stays in prison, the harder that transition will be. Yeah. My name is Larry Broderick. Dan Broderick was my brother. I am saddened that I will never share again memories of a lifetime with Dan. I am deeply saddened to have lost the last 20 years with Dan and Lindy and all of our future together. I am saddened by the devastation visited on Dan's children by this woman's outrageous acts. The overwhelming emotion I feel is rage. I have become a bitter, angry person over the years. And in order to more fully understand what I am about to say, it is important, I believe, for you to know that I believe that the criminal sitting before you is a psychopath. I am enraged that this self-centered, lying psychopath executed Dan and Linda. I am enraged by what this murderer did to my mother and father. I am Roger Kolkina, K-O-L-K-E-N-A, brother of Linda Broderick. In my view, the most important question before the panel is, if freed, can Betty Broderick do it again? If someone were to cause her to feel enraged, or if she felt compelled to settle an old score, might Betty Broderick kill again? I don't know. The doctors don't know. No one can know. It is my heartfelt conviction that for the safety and well-being of the Broderick family, the Colquina family, and the community, Betty Broderick should remain confined for the rest of her days. You know, your heart is still bitter. You're still angry. You're, you're, you're showing no significant um, progress in evolving as a person past this situation. And I think what was even more overwhelming than just us talking about it was your own kids, who you talk to all the time, and they're saying, "Mom, you got to move on. You, you're still there. You're still back 20 years ago." 